Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome on behalf of the Global Responsible Leadership Initiative. Uh, for those of you that I haven't had the fortune of meeting yet, um, my name is John North. Um, I'm joining you from the garden route in South Africa. Um, and uh, as mentioned, linked to the GRLI. Um, very briefly, before I uh, introduce uh, our uh, key uh, speakers and facilitators. Um, just something about the GRI. It's, uh, uh, it's been going now nearly for 20 years. It's an ongoing and collaborative inquiry into global responsibility. So it's a, a, it's a question we ask, what is global responsibility? How might we develop it? Um, and this inquiry has been working mainly in the space of management education and leadership development, also in strategic partnership with uh, EFMD uh, and AACSB International, which are two major accreditation bodies, alongside the United Nations Global Compact um, and WETCOS International Student Network focused on uh, sustainability. Um, this series and the format uh, of today uh, we're calling Deep Dives. Um, Basically, the idea is that uh, partners and associate partners of the GOI, such as Leadership Global, uh, have an opportunity to share some of their learning and insight with the community, but also beyond the borders of the GOI community. We are recording the call. If there are any sessions of issues discussed, uh, anything that you'd like us to remove from the recording, we can arrange that. Um, uh, and if there are no objections after the call, we will at least the presentation part of it posted also on online. So I think that is it from my side. I'm going to hand you over to John Knight's uh, chairperson and Greg Young, CEO of Leadership Global. And um, I look forward to joining in conversation with you on this topic. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, John, uh, for the introduction and also for uh, sponsoring this, which we feel is a very important uh, event. Um, I'll just say a couple of words um, about uh, myself and Greg, um, just to put it into context. Um, we both have um, experience as senior leaders. That was where our prime careers were. Um, in a, a series of industries, but but primarily technology-based type industries. Um, <clears throat> and about 20 years ago, just over 20 years ago, when we started Leadership, it was a time when coaching and emotional intelligence were almost at their dawn. And um, we were realizing, having becoming, having become mature leaders, if you like, that it really we really needed to change um, how leadership was shaped for the future. So we are where we are now 20 years later. So let's, we can show the next slide, Greg. Okay, so just as a quick introduction, the background is that our world is changing ever faster and getting ever more complex. Even if I, I don't have to go back as far as the beginning of my career, I just have to go back to the beginning of this century, the huge differences that have happened and how things are changing so much faster. So the big question that we have is how do we develop leaders to best impact the future in a positive way? And we believe that we need a new mental model of leadership, which is very different from the traditional approach that we generally see today. There are exceptions, but not many. And so we need to develop individuals to lead in this new way. And when we look forward, we, we would like to just imagine that every student leaving university is aware of and has been prepared to lead in this new way. Just imagine that. And in the rich world anyway, I mean, between 30 and 50% of all um, of all people, young people, go to university. So this would be a huge impact if we could do that. 
And today we'll share our ideas. We don't pretend to have all the answers. We've certainly got some ideas. And of course, that's why we want this to be um, a collaborative um, with, uh, with, with you, all of you who've shown an interest in this topic. Um, and more important, we'd like to be at the start of building a movement to developing better leaders for the future. Um, how to build, how, how can we build on a, on a basic framework? What methodologies are required? How to introduce it into tertiary education? These are the questions that we need to, to, to discuss. And we will try to make this, although we are going to be making doing presentations, we will try to make this as interactive as, as we can and get your input as much as we possibly can. So with that, I'll hand over to Greg. Um, and think about what the objectives I'm completely stunned by the way of the caliber of people that have joined this conversation. As John said, we don't know all the answers, so it's good to get some people around in the group so that we can explore that. And as we go through, by the way, if you've got something that you, you feel that you want to say, if you just use the raise my raise your hand icon in Zoom, um, then we can then we can come to you. Okay, so what are the objectives for the day? I, I think it's I always like to follow a, an easy path for the, the, the why, the what, and the how. So, so for me, the why is, you know, why are we holding this session? And more and more with our international partners, with our clients, you know, we're hearing that there's been a step change. Um, initially, it started off with how the heck do we lead Gen Z? Um, and that's still something that we may will we'll come into the conversation that we have today. But then, as John's already pointed out, not only do, do, how do we lead then Gen Z, but how do we bring them into the fold and think about how to spread this new model of leadership uh, for people in the future? So why are we holding this session? Why it's different? Why it matters? And then we'll move on to the what. So what, what do we know? Um, what might the solution be and what would that include? And then finally, how do we create a movement? How can we, can we work together and how can we help? So that, you know, we can, we can introduce something of the leadership portfolio into that, but really it's how do we create the movement, the global movement for this um, new model of leadership? I, th I think it's important that, um, we just think about Generation Z and think about actually who we're talking about and what are the characteristics of that generation. So, you know, in my research for this, I, I pulled together, these are all of the different um, generations. So Gen Z, 1997 to 2012, currently aged about 12 to 27. Um, after that comes Generation Alpha. So Gen Z at some point are going to be leading Generation Alpha. So, and before then, where am I in between boomers in Gen X? And, you know, John, I think you're more of a boomer. You're a little bit older than me. Um, and then, of course, we've got the people before. Notable in this, in this collective today is that we don't have many Gen Zs. Okay, so it would be great if those who are a Gen Z among you have a loud voice, because I think that's really important. Okay, um, so what's influenced Gen Z? Well, you know, the more data than one can get, of course, comes from the American perspective. So Obama would have been president. Our key technologies would have been, you know, laptops, MacBooks, iPads, social media really started. So Google, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. How do they, how do they get influenced? Through user-generated forums. So it's less from a, a, an expert to influence them. It's more around sharing information and ideas. Um, financial values, you know, impulse purchases, buying stuff online. I want something now. I can get it with Amazon Prime. It can be delivered tomorrow. I'm not even going to get out of my bed to order it. Uh, and actually, they accept they're going to be in some form of lifelong debt you know, a lifetime mortgage, maybe even not being able to afford a house. So they're going to be renting for their whole houses, all of those sorts of things. Um, their purchase influences, so brand evangelism, 
you know, we have Teslas, we have Apple, you know, those sorts of things are, are really important to this generation. Jokingly, I read, I was doing the research for this, that actually the difference between the different generations, and of course, this is from the perspective of the person who wrote it. So, you know, it's going to cause controversy but in, in humorous terms. You know, the thing was, if you want to get a boomer to do something, you just tell them to do it. If you want to get a Gen X to do something, you give them a bonus. Uh, if you want to get a millennial to do something, you take a picture of them, post it on Instagram, and then they'll, they'll do it because of that reward. But if you want to get a Gen Z to do something, it's really, really difficult. So actually what you do is you tell their mother to do it. She'll do it instead. So, you know, that's a gross categorization, I know. But, um, uh, but you know, that in a, in a kind of a nutshell of the person who wrote it when I was doing this research. So what, what makes this generational different? Um, well, you know, in this hockey stick world, global temperature, you know, in the, in more recent years that's going up and climate change is on the news on a daily basis. Population, um, especially in Asia and Africa, uh, is ever increasing. Moore's law, you know, micro post processes, this is a, this is a logarithmic scale. Although it looks linear, actually, it's, it's exponential and world GDP per capita. And what you can see about this is it's a one-way curve. It's not going back. It's not oscillating. You know, it's a one-way thing. So things are fundamentally changing and the rapidity of the way things are changing uh, is also accelerating. Uh, the number of internet users worldwide from 2005 to 2022, you know, you can see this, this increase. So we 5.3 billion um, you know, in the world on the internet. Likewise, social media. I think the first social media was around 1996 or something like that. Um, 2003, LinkedIn launched, to you know, full Facebook launched. Um, you know, the, so the impact of, you know, these new technologies and everything coming along is absolutely uh, massive not only for Gen Z, but for following generations too. But this group is the third to derive most of their information uh, from social media. So what are the consequences of that? Well, I grew up with news sources. I'm in, located in the UK. So it might be the BBC or it might be a newspaper or whatever. But they're largely, they may be biased, but they're still validated news sources. Whereas on social media, there is no necessary validation to the news that is being received. It's very much needs to be in the filter of the individual who's receiving that information. So that's something that, if you like, that critical thinking is, is different as well. So we have all of these 21st century stresses that have come in, but I don't think there's anything that is impacted so much and in such a short time as the experience that we all had uh, recently going through COVID, which introduces us to this additional challenge and made very clear and brought into sharp focus the additional challenge of complexity. Um, you know, when somebody gets ill in Wuhan in China and it leads to an 87% reduction in air pollution in Bangalore, you know, you're living in a complex adaptive system. And, and, you know, for many, for many people, this idea of living in the system, one can easily intellectualize but the experience of it and leading it well, uh, is a real challenge. Uh, this quote from Stephen Hawkins, I think that the next, the 21st century will be the century of complexity is really apt. And I, and I think when we think about models of leadership, we need to move away or move into a model where leading well in complexity is, is understood and well-practiced. So what we're doing is we're moving really from the concept of organizations as machines 
um, from machine to an organism. So moving from what we might describe as Newtonian physics to quantum physics. Newtonian where force is mass times acceleration, what you put in, you get out. A quantum physics, which is a lot more, um, many things can be many things all at once, I guess. The, the challenge here is that it's not an either or, but it's an and and both. Yeah, we have to recognize that we were able to put a man on the moon using Newtonian physics. It, it, there's some really good stuff in there. So we can't throw everything out and say, no, it's a new world. We have to move on to something else. So we have to integrate the concept of, of quantum physics, if you like, into Newtonian physics and look at it in the round. So we're moving from what might be complicated to complex. And there is a real distinct difference between those two. So we're moving also then from deterministic leadership to non-deterministic leadership. And the, the, the sort of key attributes of a complex adaptive system is that there needs to be a clear purpose and that there are simple rules and boundaries that need to be followed. So it's made up of many individual parts or agents. There is no leader that coordinates the action of others. There are, it's emergent, so the patterns emerge through interaction of agents. And it reacts and adapts to the elements if, if there is, is a perturbation, if there's something that comes in from outside. And of course, the thing that makes it complex is the nonlinear relationship between input and output. And much of the work that we're doing right now is working with organizations to help them migrate between um, leadership in the more traditional sense and leadership in complex adaptive systems. And we've got programs and exercises that help them do that and experience. That. So this is how we traditionally view an organization. If you move into a new organization and say, well, how does it work? Probably one of the first things I'll do is to show you an organogram, usually with the boss at the top. And this is, you know, these are the various divisions and you've got the front liners. But this is actually how work gets done. And on this sort of model, you don't even, can't even see where the chief executive is, but this is the way that work gets done. So this is the way that we need to change our mental model of leadership. So I suppose come to our first question, which I'd love to get your input from. So if you like to open up your microphones, is what are the behaviors that you're observing and how are they impacting organizations and the performance of those organizations? So I'd love to, I'd love to hear from the floor really on this and, and see if we can get a, a, a discussion going. Who's going to be the first to, to contribute to this? Richard. I'll jump in here, Craig, briefly. I, I yeah. certainly from my experience in working in, on the business side of things and working with consulting firms primarily and their interaction when they're working with senior leaders in organizations is a greater sense of collaboration, of working with, of this idea of co-creating, that there are no longer experts that have all the answers and they come in with the final solution, a hypothesis and a great solution they're going to recommend, but there's a sense that there's got to be ownership in different parties and different people in co-creating solutions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We're, we're finding that this sort of co-creating thing, um, and of course, what that means is for, um, for leaders, especially the more mature, more mature in age leaders, it means letting stuff go. Yeah. It means that they're no longer if like being in charge so much It's pretty, is creating an environment for that co-creation sector. And, and it requires greater vulnerability to sort of not necessarily to have all the answers, which you're thinking of the classics and consulting practice, so you come in with all the, and there's that great power imbalance because the consultants have the data and the knowledge and now actually know, well, you don't, and, and you don't necessarily need to have to, and how does that look and feel? So there's also this sort of increased need for emotional intelligence and empathy that goes with that in the co-creation model. And, and, and it almost so, feels like abdication. Mears, yes. Well, yeah. Mears, as sorry, you can just come to Mears because he has his hand raised. Yeah, thanks. I completely agree with what, uh, uh, Mrs. Richards, with John just said, 
what concerns me in terms of observing behavior is, although I see that is the opposite in terms of where you say there's no filter anymore and we must apply our own filters and that depends on the individual, whether what we read in the media is true or not. Um, and then it, what really concerns me is how many leaders of large organizations and political leaders choose not to see the evidence that you just have shown and choose not to see the, new, the, the, the need for a different kind of approach. They still stuck in the Newtonian physics, in the course <laughs> and effect and linear thinking. And I'm, I'm not sure how we're going to get beyond that. I see it all over, not only in our country, in all businesses and politics. Absolutely. In me, as you've excited me now, because that's exactly why we're here. This, that, that is the phenomenon that I think is frustrating us. So Andre, you, you have your hand up and, and then, uh, uh, yeah, Andre, you have your hand up. Thank you, thank you, Greg. So you know, I I I I I, I do quite a bit of this leadership stuff with a lot of people around the world, but not only in organizations, also looking at societal models and you know, really, what is the evolution of man? And we all focus on what's changing, as you so eloquently stated, and I agree with a lot of it. What's not changing? What's constant? What has not shifted? Decision-making is still a behavior I see people operating with, irrespective of the fact that we don't agree with their decisions. <laughs> I live in South Africa, so Mia's commented on it and hinted on it earlier. Everybody's making decisions. The other thing is, everybody's taking action. Action-taking has not changed, irrespective of the tools of the day. But the sense making is constant, although we see it differently. The sense making, the decision taking, and the action taking is happening. Now, here's the thing that I do notice in terms of your question. We all seeing it differently. And because we're seeing it differently and we think on different beliefs and execute on those differently. There has been a divergence of how we play together. Globally, I'm watching our operation levels are decreasing. You know, you, you have that slide of everything is increasing. Some things are decreasing. Cooperation. <laughs> the other thing that I noticed around the world when I look at the trend is that tolerance is at an all-time low. People are not tolerating anymore. Like, you know, I'm a... I'm a, I'm a 60s baby, so, you know, we were taught by the Catholics, you take the beating and you tolerate. And nowadays, these latest guys, they, they, they don't tolerate. They don't even want to cooperate. And more and more, I'm also seeing a decrease in people's ability to adjust. So, so, so that's what I'm seeing in terms of behavior. We're all making sense, decisioning, action taking, but we're seeing it differently. Tolerance, cooperation, adjustment, all time low. That's me. And Andre, thank you. I, I, I kind of want to push back now because like you, I'm a 60s baby. And I taught, I have two daughters, both of whom are gen beds. And actually, when I speak with them, uh, the, the low tolerance, actually they're more tolerant than any. Uh, the, the cooperation, they're incredibly cooperative. So, you know, I can't help but feel as a 60s person, you know, somebody born in the 60s, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the world through my lens and my experience and not necessarily through theirs, which I think is, is really important. I, I don't know if, Carolyn, whether you can speak, but you've self-identified, as Chen said, on the chat. So I, I'd love to get, get uh, input from your perspective if you, if you can. If you can't, just let us know. And, and, yeah. and My, right. Michael has also admitted to being a Gen Z, but, but wants to be a millennial. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've been, I've been ca carefully listening. Um, and the, the question was about behaviors and how yeah. 
what you're observing and how they're impacting organizations and their performance. So as you can see, I'm outside. So I chose intentionally to go outside for a couple of minutes because otherwise I wouldn't have managed on my very busy work day. And I, a behavior I've, I've been seeing in, in Gen Z and the people I've been working with um, is that there's increasing need to draw boundaries of work and life. Okay. Um, and it's, it's challenging in a very fast evolving world. You're trying to adapt to, to various things and you are in a very busy life. Uh, also in a very busy work life um, and I've seen people uh, trying to draw more boundaries and it's uh, and it's not it's not easy I've, I've heard someone saying this week um, a, as a Gen Zler in in a team of not Gen Z people she's the only person uh, in her team who who's really trying to finish her work at let's say 4, 4 p.m or 5 p.m and everyone else is not really role modeling that from her team. They're all working over hours and she's the okay. only person who's doing that. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I see, I see that as, as, as an, as something that the, the younger generation has an increasing need to do is to, to, to draw a boundary between work and, and private life. And uh, me, what I did now is I went outside at least for once a day because I didn't, I wasn't able to draw a boundary this mm -hmm. afternoon when I was supposed to have my lunch break. So I at least wanted to see a bit of sunlight uh, in that meeting where I'm not facilitating um, as I do for the rest of the day, most of the time. Um, so maybe that's an example of a behavior <laughs> that, yeah. uh, that the younger generation is doing. I'm not sure. Um, having a walking, walking meeting, a walking call. Um, and then, then what else, um, what came up for me when I read and, and heard about your question is that me as a, as, as co-leading this, this organization together with Michael, I feel like what makes a difference is to take the time for people, especially if you, if you are in a very volatile environment as we are in a, in a student organization and a nonprofit organization, there's a lot of um, emotions, there's a lot of uncertainty, and there needs to be space to speak about this. Um, so I've seen it being perceived as very positive by, by our team as we actually speak about how we're feeling. And not just about what we're doing. So taking the time in between meetings, uh, taking time at the beginning of a meeting, uh, checking in with people, um, what's going on with them, and instead of just uh, following the, the the business routine in a way. Um, and also when you perceive that someone is struggling, as a leader to actively take the time to listen to them, um, even though you may not fully understand where it's coming from, and already um, for 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 the team members to to have the space to express themselves can already make a difference also on their performance because um if they feel like they they are safe um psychologically safe with with yeah. their leader um they are able to better perform and um this this element of psychological safety is something i feel like it's also very important to me. I'm able to better perform if I feel safe in a team, if I feel like my teammates are there for me. And if, it's, if it feels like a team, if it feels like collaboration rather than, yeah, rather than the contrary. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my contribution for now. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. And that's, it, it's invaluable having you here. Michael, did, did you want to contribute? Yeah, I'd like to. To add, just I have I have many thoughts to add, but I want to just add one thing because I believe it could help with the idea of uh, how can how can the other generations understand the younger generations a bit better. Um, I heard a quote recently, which goes uh, I heard it in German, but I tried to translate. It goes pretty much in line. In the past, not everything was better except for one thing, which was the future. And if you think about it, that is very true because today the future, the outlook is not that bright. If, if we have the 60s babies here, when, when you were growing up, there was just, you, you were close, close, actually very close to World War II and you were rebuilding, you were just in everything is developing, growing. 
and you had a bright future. You just put in the work. You, you're going to get everything you want. And that, that promise is not existing anymore. And that's also why we need psychological safety, why we need maybe also some, some utopists who give us a, a reason to live and uh, something to, to strive towards too. Um, because what we see and hear every day in the news is, is not that bright. Yeah, thank you. An interesting um, observation. Very recently, we had uh, uh, an internal CPD meeting, and uh, in, in in that meeting was the ex chief people officer for a company called ASOS. I don't know if any of you have heard of the sort of online clothes retailer. Um, and they used to have bring a parent to work day, and they said that that was incredibly useful uh, to cross fertilize perspectives. Um, that weren't necessarily weren't necessarily spoken about in the home environment, but they could see how their 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 children were making their way in the world, and it reframed the relationship between uh, the parent and the, and the uh, and the colleague. So that was you know incredible. Anyway, I'm just going to uh, draw this to a to an end right now because I'm going to hand over to John and to discuss the what. And in order to do that, I need to stop sharing so that he can. So, um, okay, John, so, go ahead. Right. So I need to share now. You yep. do. Okay. Oh, God. This is a living example of technology and yeah. uh, the intergenerational comfort with technology. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm getting to view. I've got, I was in, oh, goodness me. Sorry, I've got to go out of that and go into share again because I was in the wrong. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to share now, but I'm going to have to. Okay. A bit. Sorry, I was in the wrong place here. Okay, so we're there. So the question is now, is what kind of leadership? Sorry, I've lost being able to see anybody here. So, all right, okay. Right, I'm ready. Um, so what kind of leadership does this require that we've been discussing? And um, so let's go through quickly. What do we know? What might be the solution? And what does it include? It's very interesting that as we have over the last 20 plus years have been developing a leadership development journey for individuals, primarily geared towards senior executives, which is where our sweet spot has been. Um, it's very interesting that as the world becomes more complex and the need to change leadership becomes more apparent, the journey that we take people on has become more relevant, uh, which, is, which is good and, and interesting. So what we're looking at here is the model of, of development where we start with purpose and vision. And what is typical is on where the most um, development of individuals and leaders is, is on the, the left-hand side, the objectives, the strategy, the execution, typical consulting stuff leading to organized performance. What has been lacking and is still lacking is the, is the focus on cultures and values and behaviors. And without those two together, we're never going to get the kind of uh, leadership, the kind of organizations that are going to provide not only the productivity, but also the psychological safety that um, Carolyn's talking about. So what we need to do is provide a strong sense of relevant purpose 
to decentralize decision making. And it's very, really interesting that if we look over the 20, 20, last 20, 25 years, decision making is actually centralized. You know, if you go back 20, 30 years ago, a bank manager could make a decision about a mortgage. Now it's an algorithm. And that is because software has basically enabled the ego driven leaders of organizations to take more control. What we need to do more of is to centralize this collaboration, coordination, and communication. So how do we do that? So we've got this old method of, um, you know, hierarchy, elephants being a very good example of that. Whereas complex adaptive systems and leadership in that is very much reflected by a murmuration of starlings. And again, as Greg was saying, it's not one, it's both. We need both. We need to be careful how we use these. Now, this is one of the really important points um, that has been a, is, a, is a reason why leaders don't change. Because they're always thinking about changing the world, but they're not thinking about changing themselves. And that is what is so critical. If you're going to change the world, you've got to change yourself first. And so the focus, we believe the focus is not on how you change the world. The focus is on you, how you change yourself. And that's where we feel the real opportunity is um, within tertiary education. So let me just briefly describe what, how I would describe what we call transpersonal leadership. It's about leaders operating beyond their ego realizing that personal development is is lifelong they are radical ethical and authentic while emotionally intelligent and caring now that's a you know easily said very difficult to get to and as a result of that they create performance enhancing value based and sustainable cultures and the way we think that that puts together in the in the human brain, if you like, is to combine rational, emotional, and spiritual intelligence. And where the focus today is very much on rational intelligence in terms of education, um, it's about intellect, it's about analysis. We believe that emotional intelligence is at least e as equally important, especially when it comes to leadership. And by the way, in this complex world, to one extent or another, everyone is a leader. But you get the performance enhancing through combining the irrational and emotional intelligence. But you also need the spiritual intelligence, which we define as being as bringing values to full consciousness. It's not about religion in any way. And when you combine emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence, that's where the caring and sustainability comes from. And where you combine spiritual and rational is where the ethical comes from. And we need to bring those three together. And it's that point in the middle, which we call transpersonal leadership. Another way to look at this is that the typical journey towards leadership development, very much on the left-hand side is where we see most of the development happening today. Business, organizational skills, strategic thinking, vision, di direction, et cetera, et cetera. Much less on the behaviors, shaping cultures, values and ethics, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where we believe the focus needs to be. Another way to look at this, which I'm not going to go through this, but these are the kind of, these are the steps, the 18 steps that we take people through in our transpersonal leadership development programs, where the intermediate set, set is more about developing emotional intelligence, and the advanced stage is more about developing uh values and bringing those values to full consciousness in everything we do and this is shows in another way the hierarchy of intelligences now we often see amongst senior leaders we see that they've got the intellect we see quite often that they've got even got the ethics of course there are those that in the in the news quite frequently you don't have the, that either but quite often we see leaders who have the ethics and the intellectual, but they don't have the emotional awareness. They don't have the emotional behaviors that are needed to bring those two together. Um, a perfect example of that was not that long ago when I was in India and I was talking to a, a managing director of a bank. And he was talking to me about 
how he wanted to develop leadership in his organization and how he wanted to help the community. And he wanted to um, really um, do what he could for the employees, et cetera, et cetera. And then he decided that his HR director should be in the meeting. And he picked up the phone and said, can you get down here right away? So he had the values, but he didn't have the behaviors. And that's a very simple example. But that is one of the reasons why we have so many problems is the emotional intelligence. So we have two levels. We have the intermediate level, which I say focuses on emotional intelligence. We have the advanced level, which focuses on the spiritual intelligence. Won't go through that in detail now, but happy to take anybody through it. And we have this transpersonal, what we call the transpersonal cycle, which is about, first of all, raising awareness, then changing behaviors, then increasing consciousness, and then bringing those values into, into the role in everything we do. So if we look quickly at the intermediate level, we've got to remember that when we are born, we are still Stone Age. And the only difference between us today and Stone Age man is the environment that we've been brought up in. So, and that, that helps us to change and adjust. At the moment, that experience we have in life is serendipity. You know, who are your parents? Which country are you born in? Um, what kind of education? What, what luck do you have as a mentor uh, for mentors or for your, for your uh, employment, et cetera? Of course, there's some hard work in there, but a lot of it is luck and serendipity. So within that, how much we learn about how to behave is very much up for grabs rather than something that's, that's taught or, or developed consciously. And so that is why we have, we've, we've got this default as a human being, we've got this default where we go back to being a Stone Age man if we're not careful, if we don't have any way to control that. And many people don't have that. I mean, anger is just a typical, typical thing. If we just quickly look at how the brain works, we get this stimulus from our senses, from our five senses. And through the stimuli, through electromagnetic signals, typically go directly to the amygdala. The way we show our intelligence as human beings is to help those stimulate those uh, signals to actually go via the prefrontal cortex where we can actually manage um, how we react. And the, the whole idea of emotional intelligence is about how we learn to reconfigure how our brain works. So that ideally we get it to go through the prefrontal cortex where we can make some rational decisions about whether um, our emotional response is going to be positive or not. And ideally it'll go through the hippocampus where our memory banks are. So it helps with the in intuition, using intuition to make those decisions. These kind of things are really important. Now we use a model um, which was originally developed by Goldman 20 odd years ago, but we've, we've developed it somewhat where the emotional intelligence is broken down into four key competencies, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship management. And within that, there are 19, what we call EI capabilities. Those are the ones with the dots there. I'm not going to go through all of them at all, but I think what is important is that the, we, we have, um, a quite sophisticated, um, personal development tool that measures these emotional intelligence uh, capabilities. And we have found over the last 10 or 15 years, very uh, consistently that empathy in the social awareness bracket and four of the bullets in the relationship management, that's developing others, change catalyst, conflict management, and inspirational leadership are the key areas where that leaders need to develop. So it's all about dealing with other people. That's where the key need is. 
And the other thing that is really important here is that for each of those bullets, there are four granular behaviors. Now, that means that there are 76 granular behaviors that you need or we need to have to be fully emotionally intelligent. Now, I'm not going to go through all these in any way, but I'll just go through one. The empathy cycle. That's the number one development area that that many leaders need to develop further. And the four granular behaviors are that they listen attentively, demonstrate awareness of feelings, identify cause of perspective, and express understanding of perspective. Now, the interesting thing is that the, the, the most common granular behavior out of all those 76 amongst leaders, and it's quite high, is that they don't demonstrate their awareness of the feelings of others. They listen attentively, maybe. They maybe even be able to cause the perspective, but they don't feed it back. Very simple, but that's a huge uh, area that limits a leader's competence. We have these five, six leadership styles. Now, each of those leadership styles have a number of EI capabilities. And we reckon that there's probably for each leadership style, an individual needs between 12 and 16 granular behaviors. If they can identify just one or two in each of those styles, that will make them a much better leader. Most people, and these are often very senior leaders, are only competent in one or two styles. To be a really good leader, you need to be competent in all of them. And they tend to be more competent in the visionary, pace setting and commanding less competent in general with the democratic, the coaching and the affiliative, which of course are the, the, kind of, the, the kind of styles that are needed for collaboration. We can also link these leadership styles to organizational culture. We have four um, parameters that we measure, power, structure, achievement, and support. And each of those relate to one or two different leadership styles. What is really interesting, though, is that when we, when we, again, this is done through another tool that we have, when we measure the actual culture in an organization, we, get, we typically get something like the dark green um, columns, where power is the overriding culture, followed by structure, followed by achievement and support, last of all. Yet, if we ask people, what would your ideal culture be? It doesn't matter whether we ask people at the top of organizations or at the bottom of organizations or anywhere in between. In general, they will choose the light blue column response, where they want achievement followed by support, much less power, and some less structure. Now, and that ha that that's the same across the world. It, this is not this is not uh, country specific or culture specific. It's across the world. So in some places, it's a bit more exaggerated the the shape than others. But but generally, that is the way it goes. Now, what we're saying here is that the the ideal is based on the hist on history, whereas the light blue, the ideal culture, is based on human need, human desire. If we move to the um, advanced level. This is where we add in our, to our um, competencies the, self, the, the spiritual intelligence part, self-determination, personal conscience. What does that mean? We're talking about now about bringing our values to full consciousness. Personal conscious values. Who am I? Really important. Most people have a, a fair set of values, but they don't bring them to full consciousness in the decisions they make. The most typical ones that organizations will talk about when they talk about the culture in an organization or, or the, uh, 
the five most important things they do or whatever. They will talk about trustworthiness, truth, excellence, and integrity. But equally important are these other kind of softer, um, more nuanced values like fairness, conscientiousness, humility, vulnerability, patience, forgiveness, altruist, altruistic love. It's not often that when people are being interviewed for top positions, they will ask them about those uh, personal conscience values that are in bold there. And then the other set of values are those that are about self-determination. In other words, what am I going to do with who I am? Where purpose, courage, and resilience are particularly important, as well as this continuous development. So one of the questions I'd like I always like to ask people is so what drives you? What's the main driver of your ego? Now there are four possible possible answers here power, prestige, recognition and reward. And we all have a preference. And they might change as you <clears throat> as you mature, as you grow older, as, you ch as your life changes. I certainly, personally, for example, I've never been particularly financial reward oriented, I've, but I was quite power oriented when I was younger. Um, and now, if I'm honest, it's probably more about recognition. But the important thing is not that you shouldn't have a driver. It's not immoral to have a driver of your ego. But what we need to do as leaders is to be able to manage that so that it doesn't control the way we operate as a leader. So we don't put ourselves first when we're making leadership decisions, that we think of others, that we think of the greater good. So we have the choice to either have ego-based leadership or transpersonally in the interest of all stakeholders. So, and, and please, anybody who'd like to come in at any time on this um, with any answers or suggestions, I'd be more than happy to, to, uh, to encourage, I'm, I'd really like to encourage that. Um, but who is the most important shelter on your business today? This is a typical list of, of important stakeholders to organizations. What do you think most, most organizations would answer today? I don't think you can see my hand, so I'm just gonna oh, quickly yes, sorry. jump in. Yes, please. All good, all good. Um, I just had a thought that I wanted to share, um, especially for those slides that you shared earlier about the different leadership styles and how all of them are sort of important for being a being a good leader in a way. Yeah. Um, I find this quite quite challenging. This thought of being like um, in order to be a um, a good leader to be able to to excel in all these areas and be democratic and affiliative and um, but at the same time being able to provide a structure in a way and that all of them are are, are important. So what I found quite helpful to to step into a role as as co-president of Oikos that it's actually a co-presidency, um, so that you're co-leading. And you're sharing the responsibility and you bring in different strengths because, um, as you also shared earlier, we, we all come from a different background. So, um, and even if we're self-aware and, and willing to develop also in the areas where we're not necessarily always the best at, um, it's nice to have someone on your side who may compliment yeah. you in absolutely, in no, absolutely. So, yeah. I mean, we, we work with a couple of organizations that do have co-CEOs like that. Um, it it only works if there is huge trust between those two people, by the way. Yeah. So it's not an easy match. You know, it's more like a, a sort of a, a non-romantic wedding. I mean, it's really, it, it's really important that. But I think the other, the other thing that is, um, and, and, it, and it's been quite a common thing to say, you know, surround yourself with people who are good at different things than you so that you have a you know a broader team there's nothing wrong in that 
But what I think is really important is it's also um, it's also not developing yourself if you just accept that you rely on somebody else. So you know, a huge opportunity for you is if there are certain things that M Michael is or certain styles he's better at than you, for example, then learn from that and develop yourself so that you can develop those. Because if you can identify those two or three granular behaviors that would enable you to be as good as him in that particular style, for example, um, then, you know, that's, that's, that's you developing into a new you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Michael, something, something for us to work on, right? <laughs> um, so, okay. So uh, just to answer this question here, that the, the, the um, <clears throat> shareholders and senior executives tend to come out as number one on a, uh, more often than not. And you will see that uh, in some areas, staff and employees and customers will, will probably come out uh, second and third. However, if we, if we ask the, the, the question a different way and we say, so who needs to be the most important stakeholder in your business for success in the future? It often changes the answer. And people are much more likely to go down towards the bottom part of the of that list, towards the community and the planet. And even suppliers are now becoming more important as people understand the complexity of uh, supply chains, etc. So getting close to the end here, but um, one of the other things is is the decision making process. I, um, I don't know who it was who made, sorry, who mentioned about the decision making process, but very much the decision making process in most organizations and in most people is stuck in that rational logic, which is at the conscious level. Whereas m most of the real decision making is done at the intu intuitive, instinctive, and insight level and with our ethical philosophy. But we do it unconsciously, and the often the rational logic is 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 justifying in some cases, explaining in others why we came to a decision um, subconsciously. Intuition is in a very important process that is underrated. That is based on our personal experiences and our memory. Instinct is based on our, you know, innate uh, humanity. Insight is based on those aha moments that we have. An ethical philosophy, which is really important, and there's some really interesting uh, uh, exercises one can do about ethical philosophy. But basically, we have we each of us has a tendency to one one of three kinds of ethical philosophy. One is rules based, one is social conscience, and one is integrity. And about a third of the population favor each. There's huge uh, research on this, by the way. So understanding how we as individuals actually make decisions at a conscious, subconscious, and unconscious level is really important and will help us to make better decisions, especially if we can discuss in th this kind of way with others for important decisions. I won't spend time on purpose now because I think we can um we can maybe do that at another time when there's more uh when we have more time but I just wanted to touch this last thing this touchstone for every decision we make every important decision we make it's ideal to have a touchstone so that we actually consider certain things around that decision what we call our transpersonal qualities are where we we ask ourselves about, are we caring? Are we being radical? Are we being ethical, authentic, et cetera, et cetera? And then we bring into it, what are the important values of our own that we're adding? And these on the left are sort of the, the, the key ones for me. Integrity and fairness are sort of who I feel I am. Um, and the others are areas that I work on, but think are really important. 
and we all have our own um, touchstones, which we can develop through asking ourselves which are the most important areas here for us. So just finishing off, it's our choices, Harry, that show us what we truly are rather than our abilities. And that's where the real values come in. So what we're looking at is the right kind of leadership in the future, we believe, is about being more decentralized and distributed, more inclusive yet emergent, more values-based, and more caring. And that everyone's a leader. Everybody is a leader at a different level or to a different degree. And these are some of the transpersonal practices of a cast. Everyone's a leader. And this is related. This is a, a, a leadership um, picture of a complex adaptive system. Again, I won't go through this, but it'll be there um, as reference. And finally, the result is that we get autonomy. We get people engaged. We get people empowered trusting, non-hierarchical, or much less hierarchical, it's emergent, self-organizing, evolving from the bottom up and continual feedback. And we believe that trans the, the transpersonal leadership journey helps people to, organize, to develop organizational cultures that will develop this result. So that's me. Oh, back to you, Greg. Um, okay, you're in the uh, support um, slide. Support uh, screen, sorry. Yeah, there we go. And you're on mute. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Mia, so you, you, you have a raised hand. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, John, thank you very much for the talk. Um, it, it's phenomenal. And I just rang so much of, of what I'm feeling and thinking and researching. Just an interesting question. Um, why did, did you decide to call your approach transpersonal leadership rather than self-leadership? To me, everything that you talked about is self-leadership, not transpersonal. Well, I think it's, um, I mean, of course, in this short presentation, there were only a few little bits that we I, I kind of touched on. But I think the real thing is the transpersonal is it's about going beyond yourself. So it's about the beyond the ego. And it's about man how do you manage your ego so that as an organizational leader, you put the organization and its stakeholders before you put yourself, or at least consciously are making conscious decisions when you do put yourself first. And there may be times when you need to put yourself first because of, you know, your family, your situation. I mean, but but if we're more conscious about it, then we can do it in a more authentic way. And we can even share it with other people. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So, so this is the last part, really. And, and you know, what I would love to do is to kind of open up these, this discussion about how we can work together in a dream upon dream, how we can create a movement with, with everything that we've discussed today uh, and make a real difference. Um, it just, um, what we know from sort of Jen says, and probably after as well, is it's you know they're very comfortable with multimodal learning, e-learning. Want something that's interactive. You know, want something that's really student-centric and kinesthetic, um, informal lounge room style with multi-stimulus. And, and I know that somebody already in, in this has spoken about co-creation. You know, the, the sort of concept of leading is, is, you know, getting out of your ego and co-creating things with people. So, so that's where we're heading as an organization of 
how we run and how we do our programs. For those of you who don't know much about leadership, um, 2003, when we were born, we've got partnerships around the world. We've published, um, we, you know, deliver, a, you know, board C-suite. What we don't do very much of right now is around this future leader space. So we would love to collaborate. We would to co-create um, with the people here of something that will make that difference. If you like, on our website, that's our purpose. Uh, what we have available now, the programs that John's described, ICF accredited TLC training programs, the culture shaping tool that John described, and the, the emotional intelligence performance accelerator 360 that John describes. So we've got the tools. We've got others in the pipeline as well, which are largely um, asynchronous remote programs so that people can do them as and when they want to do. And, you know, so the, the learning can fit into their day rather than the day having to fit around them. Um, working on intergenerational leadership, the team leaders. So these are people to whom Gen Zs really um, directly report. The question I have here then is, and this is where I, we would really welcome your input, is in what ways can we work together on this? If, if the fact that you're here, the fact that you've put your energies into this, there seems to be a common desire to make something happen. So how can we do that? That's a, a question I'm throwing out there, really. I mean, Kate, Karen, I know that recently we, we had a... Gonna... Greg? Anders, come in. Yes. Yeah, I yes. don't I don't know how to raise my arm. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just did. So that was really good. Yeah. Okay, fine. No, uh, just a reflection on how can we work together. Mm -hmm. To me, I mean, the key is, uh, and that comes before we get into how, is is uh, is is making it very very clear and simple. Uh, what is the what is the purpose? I mean, where do we really want to go uh, with this? Because there are tools and there's fantastic work and 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 you know I agree with lots and lots of things there, but collaborating on it, uh, either we can take that toolbox and we can say that okay that's fine. I have used for it in my context in this way, and I may apply it in, in another way. But 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 I I I I would like to at least think about you know is there any meaningful or exciting sort of uh, purpose for 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 doing it together beyond that, which really really excites me. The toolbox and the experience of it and the way it works. And and the efficiency of it and effectiveness of it that's fine, uh, but to create a movement you maybe need something more. That's that's just a reflection on it. Otherwise, I think it's brilliant, Greg and and John, to have this available within the context that we all are working. You know, we're working with leaders in business, or we're developing uh, students for roles, future roles as leaders. Uh, but I'm I'm wondering about is there is there a higher purpose of of, of getting together and and uh, focusing on developing transpersonal leadership or you know whatever we call it is that an emerging thing is it going to change is this just a, a a a a blueprint of something which may look different in the future you know where where are we going with the collaboration okay. not the, to... you know we can share what is there but okay. I, I think fine. I think that's a, a really good point, and I'll hand over to you, John, in a minute. But let me give my, my kind of personal perspective. Um, you know, we're an organization of 28 people. Um, we can do only so much ourselves. So for us, creating a movement, and whether it's called transpersonal leadership, whether it's called, you know, as, as we in a conversation, very wonderful conversation with 
with Caroline recently, you know, talking about it, conscious leadership. Um, yeah, arose by any other name. Um, I think it's the general principles of this. You know, if we want to make the world maybe a more caring place, if we want to to help um, all of those um, alleviate many of those 21st century stresses that I, I highlighted earlier, you know, we have huge problems at the moment, certainly in the UK. Uh, I can't speak for elsewhere in the world around mental health issues. And if we agree that the essence of what John described is the way forward, this new mental model of leadership, then wouldn't it be a real shame not to do something about it on the scalable? That's my response. I, mean, I think maybe John, if you want to. Well, I'll let, let Andre, he's got his hand up. Let, let Andre oh, okay. speak first. Andre? Thank you. Um, I think I, 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 I got the gist of what you said, John. Thank you. I'm glad I joined. I most certainly did take a lot of insight and foresight from what you shared. I, I think Anders is making a very good point. And, um, you know, um, I can't boil the ocean. Um, I can only boil one kettle at a time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, I, I join people like Jordan because I watch the world as to where it's going. But I think leadership, as we've seen it today, just on the theory and then back to Anders's point. So we're trying to get people to lead. I think, I think it's a problem because no one human being can do all the things that John was talking about. It's just so complex. You know, I've yet to see one brain operate all of the neuroplasticity that it has to be able to operate like that. And, you know, Senke said it beautifully a few years ago when he pointed out that leadership is the capacity of a human community to shape its future. So now to Anders's point, how do we bring a community together? Because I think I, think I came yet in that hope without having said that at the beginning. How do I become part of the community? Well, I mean, I like what you've said, right? Greg, we say a share surname. I like what Greg's putting out there. I like what John's putting out there. But I don't trust you guys yet. I like you, but I don't trust you yet. You know, so, so, so Anders makes a very nice point. And, and, and I, I think whatever you call it, but the reason most of us are here talking, and my personal interest is how do we get communities to come together and lead and shape its future? That for me is mm -hmm. where this global, what do you call yourself, the global, whatever leadership is. Pretty. I thought, wow, wow. okay, maybe, maybe this whole. So, so, so I think, I think Anders's point is key. Mm, okay. It, uh, it takes a bit more time. It takes a bit more trust. It takes a bit more. Because Greg, I've got opportunities in South Africa. Mears will tell you in South Africa, we've got a lot of work to do here. You know, okay. these people here are, okay. you know, pulling themselves apart. They're not coming together. But, you know, in, 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 in my culture, which is African, we don't go, umuntu, umuntu, kaban. Mears is a South African. He may know it. Uh, John North made it. But a person is a person through another person. Mm. But can I, let me, thank you very much, Andre, for your, your thoughts. Let me just say one thing, going back to, to and, Anders and, and uh, reflecting on what you said as well, is that our experience is basically with senior leaders, okay? Now, that is, that is solving individual problems, if you like, in individual organizations, and that's fine. But if we're going to, to develop leaders for the future, and it can be groups of leaders, community, we, you know, collaboration, community, very important. It means that every single person that's going to operate in that community has to have some of the right kind of development, which is not happening in universities today. And that's about developing the human being in the context of leadership. I don't care if it's not called transpersonal leadership or, and there are lots of parts of, there are lots of things that we do today that need to change, that can be added, um, that need to be done differently, all those things. But 
but the the focus for me personally is I would like to see, you know, the 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 sort of the ultimate goal is that everybody coming out of university has some co some idea of what this new kind of leadership is, and that they have a path. Not that they're going to become expert or perfect. So if I just, uh, Stephen, sorry, you've had your hand up quite a long time. Stephen Hickman. Hi. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. I. I am. It was just something that I can't remember who it was, but somebody mentioned trust, and just coming on that theme and thinking about the way the conversation is going here. I'm using terms that maybe I don't know enough about because leadership really isn't my field, but um, just thinking about something I would term experiential thinking, and that's how my thinking has developed and both related to theory and things in practice. And it was the word trust. And for example, yeah, I, and there's a lot of rhetoric in my home domain about supply chains and you must trust the supplier. And, and I'm starting to learn that trust is not enough, that you need confidence in the person. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, you may trust me, but you may not have confidence in me. So I don't think it's semantics. I think it's really experiential thinking about some of these terms. And the other one that I would give is where we, we talk about empathy. We talk a lot about empathy. But it's almost, and certainly even though I'm finding in a higher education environment, so in the UK, that empathy is sometimes not enough that we need compassion. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to kind of experience a particular situation. For example, if, uh, if a particular individual has, um, is neurodiverse, then if their mentor or their, their lecturer has, is neurodiverse as well, then Possibly there's more compassion there because they're living that experience as well. So I think it's more of this experiential thinking. And I don't really know what I mean when I'm saying experiential thinking. That's my contribution anyway. Okay. Thank you very much, Stephen. John, John North. I can maybe just share a little bit of, of what, we, what, what I've seen um, in the last decade or so, at least in the context of the Joe Alliance work, um, which is um, a process of, in of collaborative inquiry that brings, in our case, senior leaders in higher and managing, management education together um, to work with questions that they don't have, that no one has an easy answer to, that there isn't a straightforward answer to. But that attracts the energy and the input from a range of perspectives. Um, and that those individuals and by extension, some of the institutions are willing to hold with others and experiment with. And in that process, build the trust, the relationships that are needed. And to add what Stevens just said, which I think is a brilliant point, the confidence in each other to act collectively. So what we're talking about there is, uh, is, uh, yeah, a, a collaborative inquiry, um, in our case into global responsibility, um, but in various contexts, um, that allows individuals to bring their whole person, uh, to effect whole system change eventually. So that's a very brief, um, and sh shortened, um, uh, way of putting it. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'd be happy to also continue that conversation at some Great. Thank you. Is it, is it all? Uh, Greg, I don't have my, I don't know the technology. Is That's it right. okay? To, okay. You go, have, ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I'm conscious of time. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm thinking about how it could be framed. I think consciousness uh, I'm thinking about the students you know, or, or, or younger mm. people or whatever, you know, the, the, the generation that is going to build the world for the future. Uh, I think it's awfully important to have being conscious about uh, an emerging complex world. And it's even more than that, that, because it's an unknown future. And it can be scary, it can be uh, exciting, challenging, but also full of 
opportunities. So that's the setting. And I think that's something that is all, uh, uh, when, when, I, when I meet master students or bachelors or whatever they are, this is always on the map or always on the agenda. But then taking it from them, okay, what does that then, how do I prepare for that? How do I prepare for that? And one important part then, if, you're, if that's what drives you, if you want to get into a career, a leadership position or whatever it is, the leadership dimension comes in. But, but, it's, but that's a way of framing how this could be sort of put in, into a larger picture, which I guess I asked for. So it starts with being conscious about how complex the world is now. And, it, and, 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 and we're becoming more and more aware of it, you know, and, and it changes. It's changing as well. Uh, and it's an unknown future that we're facing. Uh, and how do I deal with that? As a person, I, then I sort of uh, close the circle with uh, uh, referring to what John said about the whole person thing, which is fundamental to it. But the leadership dimension comes in with all, all the stuff that you have in your toolbox. So that was just a reflection on how could I get out of this, uh, having a grip on rest, on, 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 a, on, on a possible pragmatic way or practical way of doing things going forward. Okay. Thank you. And, and I think uh, Andre made a really good point as well. It is complex. And I just wonder if we can be here, we can be the butterflies in the rainforest that create a hurricane over the ocean at some point, if we have that mindset to do it. And we need to build trust. We need to build um, all manner of things, but we need to start somewhere. Yeah. And today is just the first flap of the wing. Yeah. So I'm going to have um, that to you to wrap up, if that's okay. Sorry to me. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we're, we're kind of oh, over yes. time. Oh, we are over time. Yeah. Sorry. Time flies when you're having fun. I mean, I think, uh, this was all, I think from my perspective, there was always, uh, expected to be sort of, you know, very, a very first session, uh, to get people together who are interested in, in this topic. And I know that, you know, most of the input today has been from us but that doesn't have to be the way it is in the future this is it's we've just been setting the scene if you like um and i think that uh, i think once you may have some other ideas john north but i i think that one of the things that we would like to do is to is first of all make this uh, uh recording available within gri mm -hmm. to see you know what other kind of people we can we can attract to to become part of it uh, but also, um, if we engage individually with the with and as a group, because we've got all your emails, are you all happy that we share your emails with each other? Um, and if you are, then then we can communicate with you and we can get input from everybody about where we go from here. So that we are not we don't want to just be the ones, you know, saying, well, the next session will be, but actually, yeah. you know, have a have a. A way of doing that together. Yeah, yeah. and from our side, I'm happy to to support and facilitate that in any way we can. Of course. Thank you. For those of you, um, and so there's been quite a, a lot of dialogue going on on the chat, um, yeah, chat as well. So that will be um, that's recorded and that will be circulated as well. I just want to say thank you, thank you for your input, thank you for your attention. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and you know, or, already. Um, I can sense that there's something resonating. It's just a matter of how we build that operation, trust, co-create something. Um, but there's a job to do. So thank you, everybody. And, um, you know, feel free to, to reach out to each and every one of you, every one of you, um, especially once we've shared the email addresses so that, uh, so that you can do that. But we'll be in contact with you soon. Thank you very much, Greg and John and Nisha Global for right. contributing today. Thank you, everyone. Okay. For Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. bye.